Well, I want to start with saying that I am originally from Chile. So sometimes people ask me, where is Chile and uh, how is Chile and different uh, questions about the culture. So I wanted to start mentioning where, where is Chile, basically. It, it is in South America and it is a very long country. And uh, sorry. It's Chile and not Chile. Chile. In Spanish, it's Chile. Thank you for asking. And we have a flag that is very similar to the Texas flag. So sometimes when I have a shirt with my flag or we have the flag somewhere, it's, people confuse me if I am from Texas. It's kind of interesting. So, well, a little bit about Chile. So we have the Independence Days uh, in September, um, every September 18, and uh, we uh, have the Independence Day from Spain, we have a population of about 18 million people now. And as you can see there, we are the 64 largest country in the world and the 38 largest country in the world by area. So we are very narrow. Um, you can go from the mountains to the ocean during the day. So you can go ski and then go diving. Well, the other way around probably because the high would dive. But um, it's very long. Uh, we most, uh, most of the people speak Spanish and we have English as the second language. We have multiple uh, native cultures along the country. And uh, um, I am going to show you later about that. And the name of the country is not very well uh, identified yet, um, but there are a few theories about where is the Chilean name coming? So the Mapuches, uh, native people from the central south part of Chile, they say that it's the meaning of the word where it's related to the end of the world, basically. The Quechua is another tribal that is in the south, and uh, they are talking about the coal as the Chile, and then the deepest point of the air. And again, the Mapuches have another idea that this is coming from the name of the, how the trile, which is a bird uh, that make uh, this uh, chili chili uh, sounds every time that you get close to them. So saying that, um, as you saw, the country is very long, so you can compare with US in there and have a better idea of how long it is. So you can go from one side to the other side of United States, and this is a com <coughs> excuse me, a comparison about the length and the other sense. So you can go from Canada basically to Mexico City, and uh, that is the country. So you have different weather conditions and different cultures and different uh, type of food and so on. So we have sorry, this is twist, but you can see that here this is the north part of Chile and this is the south. But because the names are in that look, in that position, we have 18 different native uh, groups going from the very north. And if you are not familiar with the very north part of Chile, basically we don't receive much rain at all. So uh, it's super dry, especially in the middle of the mountains. Uh, and uh, the coastal zone receive a little bit of rain. And then in the south, it's mostly rain and snow uh, most of the time. So, so the country is divided in uh, 15 regions, and I believe they are changing those. I am not sure if right now there are still 15 or not. But again, you can go from the north, very area, the desert, all the way to the center, which is kind of a similar weather to um, Monterey Bay in, uh, in California, and then you go south, which the weather is very similar to Alaska, basically. So as you can see in that picture, you can see the mountains, you can see the snow, and you can see a lot of buildings. That is the city, the big city, which is the capital, where the name of the capital is Santiago, and it's kind of in the middle part of the country. And uh, the capital has the highest population of Chileans in there. I think now we have 8 million, 9 million of people in that only region. So, so I am going to show you a little bit of the country. So these pictures are from the north part of the country. 
this is the high mountain or altiplano where we have wild animals in there we have lakes and a few years ago my family and i went over there and uh, we were hiking above fourteen thousand feet and uh, uh, it's very nice and then this is the city where i was a student uh, for my bachelor degree it's iquique and basically you have the mountain and then you go to the middle of the valley and then you go down to this big city which is located in this area here is called iquique then these are pictures from the central part of chile so this big city is called valparaiso and it's located in this area here and this picture is uh, uh, easter island with all the moais facing the island and then we go to the south part so this island here is, is chiloe and this is the kind of church that they have in there um, we have a lot of different cultures coming in the last few centuries to the south part of chile and so we have a lot of people coming from europe to that region and uh, and then you have uh, torres del paine it's a very well known place in the south part of chile close to punta arenas so one of mentions um this information about chile because chile has been um very well known for the amount or the number of er earthquakes that we get there actually we have the largest um, earthquake uh, in 1960 in Valdivia which is around this area over here so that was a 9.5 um, was very big we have big waves um, a lot of people die and this picture um, showed the the other big earthquake in 2015 and in the colors, you can see the propagation of the waves. And the lines we here basically are the timing from the center of the earthquake going out. And you have around 14, 15 hours after a big earthquake happened in Chile that we may be receiving some waves depending on the strength of the earthquake and the position of the earthquake and how deep the earthquake is and some other factors. So again, I was uh, born in Chile. I was, uh, uh, um, I was, uh, most of the, my early life, I was in Santiago and then I moved to Iquique. So this is a view of the university where I was studying. So we were doing a lot of research in the coastal zone and also diving far from offshore and doing a lot of research with fisheries. So we study uh, different species, very important species for uh, the economy of the country. Then um, I moved to the central part of Chile, close to Santiago, but in the coastal zone, where is this uh, international marine station um, in the city of Las Cruces. So you can see here the lights. I like this picture because you can see the lights of the street and at the end of the street is this housing here. This is the marina station and this all this area around this point it's a marine reserve area so we were working in a marine reserve area and trying to understand how the different uh, communities and uh, population and species are growing without the effect of people so, what does iquique mean yeah. oh that is um to tell you the truth i don't know what iquique means oh. yeah well, I will is, find that for you. And what about this? Las Cruces? Las Cruces mean that um, at, I think at, some, at one point when they were um, having population in this area, these, are, these areas are very far from the, from the main city, which is Santiago. They were having uh, different, um, literally, cruises mm -hmm. put in there, crosses, so in the border of the beach probably because the fishermen were fishing and somebody died or so on. And at the end, I think that was the name of that they decided to put to the town. 
So the coastline of Chile is um, like going from here to Macaja. You have one town and the next town and the next one. So this one is called Las Cruces. So then my family and I moved to Corvallis in Oregon. So maybe some of you are very familiar with Corvallis and Oregon and was a big change because we were close to the ocean. Corvallis is in, in a town in the center of uh, land uh, with a big river. And uh, so we were there for almost 12 years and then we moved to Oahu. So this picture is showing you Four Island. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Four Island. We're in Four Island in this side over here now, we have the NOAA building actually and there is where many of the scientists from NOAA or most of the scientists from NOAA are working now so I am going to play this Jason stem video for you to have more specifics about the marine biology and oceanography Hello and welcome back to Jason Live. My name is Patrick Shea, and we are here with our STEM Career Series once again, where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models currently working in those fields. Today's role model is Dr. Roberto Venegas. He's an oceanographer with NOAA's, NOAA's Coral Reef Ecosystem Division. He's joining us today from Hawaii. We're going to learn all about Roberto and his career as an oceanographer in just a moment. But before we do, I want to remind all of you out there that today's event is live and interactive. We'll be taking your questions. You can send us questions uh, to the box just below this video window, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can today. Right now, I'd like to welcome Roberto to the program. Great to have you, Roberto. Thanks for joining. Aloha from Hawaii, Patrick. Aloha. How are you doing? I'm doing great. So we're really excited to learn all about your career as an oceanographer. Um, why don't you get us started? Uh, actually, to get us started, I want to hand uh, bring in a question from Mrs. Dad's class. We have it right here. What exactly do you do as an oceanographer? Well, let me start thanking you for uh, inviting me to talk about science today. And, uh, well, I can tell you that I am an oceanographer working for uh, NOAA Fisheries, specifically with the Coral uh, Reef Ecosystem Division in Oahu, Hawaii. Um, as you can see in there, we have uh, a map uh, of the Coral Reef Ecosystem Division areas where we go and uh, monitoring and sampling. Let me start with uh, mentioning that uh, oceanography is a science that is studied in the ocean and has uh, four um, disciplines. Uh, we have um, biological oceanography, physical oceanography, as you can see there, chemical oceanography, and geological oceanography. Biological oceanography is more related to plants and animals in the marine environment. Physical oceanography is related to the condition of the process in the ocean. Chemical oceanography is studying more water composition and cycles. And geological oceanography is studying the ocean's floor formation and change. So, our mission um, as Red, the Coral Reef Ecosystem Division, is to assess, monitoring, and provide scientific information about the status of coral reef ecosystem at different islands, group of islands. The main Hawaiian Islands, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, the Marianas Islands, Samoa, and some of the remote U.S. territories. We are also providing technical and scientific assistance to countries in the Asia Pacific region. Um, as you can see there in that image, uh, one of uh, our team members, and I'm going to mention that in a little, um, it's uh, um, retrieving uh, one of the uh, temperature sensor that we have uh, to, to measure temperature and long-term uh, time series. Let me say also that um, we have different groups in CRED. We have five different specific groups. We have the marine debris group, we have the fish assembly group, which uh, Kevin was part of that. Uh, Ventic assessment, the Ventic 
Habita Mapping on Den the Oceanography Team. In the Oceanography Team, which is called the O Team, we have seven people in there. We are all science and uh, uh, we do a different aspect of oceanography. The O Team is responsible for the maintenance, deployment, and retrieval of oceanography instrument, data analysis, interpretation, and dissemination. Um, to complete these tasks, uh, we use different platforms. Those go from large vessels. Uh, we have our own uh, vessel, the Iliakai, which is standing all the time in uh, Pearl Harbor in, uh, in Hawaii. And um, we also have small boats where we do specific um, boat operations. Um, because um, this vessel that you are seeing is uh, a large vessel, so we cannot reach very uh, uh, shallow areas. So we need to use these small uh, boats where you can feed between six and eight people. And um, where you can see in the boat that we have um, the dive and some shallow rapid instruments in there when we, when we go to, to the water. So let me tell you that uh, you showed before um, some kind of uh, equipment that, that we have. Um, and we use lift bags and heavy weights. Um, we deploy those heavy weights in a specific location and then we use um, uh, which I instrument. Yeah, that is the pictures. So you can see how we move heavy equipment just to protect the coral and also to protect ourselves. And uh, it's easy also to move this heavy equipment. We have different kind of instruments, yeah. So, Roberto, you mentioned before there were four different areas of oceanography, biological, chemical, geological, and physical. W which area are you most focused on? I call myself a biophysical oceanographer. Uh, yeah, um, I also work with the climate uh, data, and we are uh, Having this collaboration now with the scientists at UH, the University of Hawaii, and the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. And uh, we are trying to understand from the biology and the physical point of view uh, how these uh, new predictions about climate change are going to affect specific areas, specific coral reef ecosystems around the world. So I understand that one of the the tools that you use quite frequently is remote sensing, or gathering data from satellites that orbit around the Earth. And we have some video here from NASA that we'd like to show um, that kind of puts some of that, how you use that into context for the students out there. Um, can you lead us into this video? Let, let us know what we're going to be looking at. Sure, sure. What you are going to look now is a short video from NASA. Uh, the title is The Ocean, a Driving Force for Weather and Climate. And basically what you are going to see is a, a nice overview of ocean process observed from space. Basically from sensors, different kind of sensors that we use to analyze the process that are occurring in the ocean. Awesome. We're, we're going to take a look at that right now. So, yeah. Thank you. Earth is the water planet. Although 40% of Earth's population lives within or near coastal regions, the ocean impacts people everywhere. Most of Earth's water is stored in the ocean, a driving force for weather and climate. The Earth's surface is warm permanently by the sun. Heat, a form of energy, helps drive ocean and atmospheric circulation. The ocean absorbs and stores more heat than the atmosphere. Both the atmosphere and ocean move. Heat. The atmosphere does this quickly, and the ocean slowly. At the ocean's surface, Winds drive currents. Multiple forces keep the global ocean available for thermal avine circulation and perpetual motion. Below the surface, deeper currents are driven by differences in density. Mixing and upwelling in the 
ocean, transport nutrient rich waters to the ocean surface. Nutrients sustain biological productivity in the ocean. Extreme variations in sea surface height and sea surface temperature affect ocean and atmospheric circulation. El Nino and La Nina occur when changing wind patterns displace warm and cool water in the equatorial Pacific. Both have global impacts. All right, we're back with Roberto Venegas. Uh, Roberto, that was, those are some amazing visuals that we get from animating the data we get from satellites. Uh, you know, why is collecting video or collecting data in this way so important to what you do? Well, basically, what we do as oceanographers, and we started a long time ago doing this around the world, uh, we have um, very patchy data sets. So we can go on a cruise to a specific region that is very expensive, and then you need to come back, so you lose the timing between that cruise and the next one. So having this information from satellite can provide you a continuous data set and that you can um, analyze them and be more clear about what you are trying to understand. If you are looking for, for temperature, you can have today basically full data set, uh, four kilometer resolution for the entire globe every day and some sensors every three hours. So, yeah, it's amazing what we can produce. So to have these tools and to have this data to, to better understand oceanography processes, change, uh, trends, and variability in general, it's it's very, very nice. And I am very happy that I, I, I work with this. We've got another question from our audience here. Um, to continue to put all of this into context, they want to know why do we have to know about the oceans? What's the point of collecting all of this great data? Well, from a point of view, the, the color we've moved now, we need to understand the patterns that are related to the conditions using the coral. So it is important to understand what is the temperature that is uh, associated to these islands, what are the kinds that are collecting these nutrients and bringing this amount of nutrients to, to the area to continue with the, the feeding of the chain. Uh, I'm talking about topic like on salt, on fish, and so on. So it is important, uh, not just for the coral reef, but in general, uh, to understand the dynamic where we live. Also, from a point of view of uh, transportation, we need to understand where we should go, where the coral is helping us to go from one side to one. So that we should not cross this area because it's dangerous. You have big waves, you have uh, eddies that can pull you to some specific areas or can be more uh, expensive to cross if you have a small boats. Those kind of uh, questions uh, are related to why we need to understand it. So know, it's very wide. Our audience is also very interested in some of the other techniques you use to, uh, to learn about the ocean, they, they want to know uh, about getting a little bit closer. How deep in the ocean have you gone? And what did you see? And another question, have you ever been to the bottom of the sea in a submersible? Well, I have been lucky to be at the bottom diving. That was a long time ago in Chile. And, uh, we were um, practicing about uh, deployment of the instruments at the time. Um, that was very interesting because uh, what I saw just in the first few meters of the water was what uh, was most, most impressive for me, actually. It was a school of the small fish coming to me, and then behind this, I saw a, a big body moving just in my direction, and that was a penguin. That was my, my first time that I was diving with a penguin that she was. It was kind of scary, but yeah, it was fun. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing about it. So, right. sorry, your second question was, oh, if I went to the deepest part of the ocean. Actually, I haven't been there, but I have a very good friend that he did that. 
and was uh, very amazing what, what you can see and this, the sensational feeling of being by yourself at that depth and uh, be able to be there. Pressure is tremendous. On top of it. What's the deepest you have there? Oh, uh, 90 feet. Okay, there we go. We've got another question coming in here from Carrie. She wants to know, what do humans do to damage the coral reefs and what can we do to better the condition of coral reefs? Well, we do as a human a lot of bad things. As, uh, you know, well, we do a lot of good things too. But um, we do a lot of pollution. We do a lot of uh, fishing in the coral reef, and sometimes uh, we overfish in those areas. So, um, to summarize, um, what are the easy steps to to help corals? For example. Uh, we should be uh, more conservative about the use of water. The less water that we use, the less water that is going to run off to the ocean and move uh, um, pollutions and uh, sediments over there. Um, talking about pollution, I think everybody should be using a bike and using the, 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 the local bus instead of the individuals driving in, in their own their own car. That way, we will reduce the amount of the CO2 that we are in the atmosphere, which is absorbed by the ocean, and then temperatures are increased, and then we have the effect of the ocean acidification, which is the decreasing in pH, which will affect and is affecting directly coral reef because they are built. The structure of the corals is uh, calcium, basically, so reducing the pH is, is damaging the corals. Um, another one could be um, use of organic uh, fertilizers instead of the chemicals that we are using. Um, you should support um, reef friendly business. So if you go diving, try to go with a group that is going to take care of the reef. Um, you can also plant a tree, basically, because you are going to reduce the amount of CO2 going to the atmosphere and indirectly affect the coral. If you go diving and snorkeling, do that uh, safe and uh, that is going to help, sorry, to, to reduce the, the damage in the, in the coral ecosystem. We have another question here from a viewer, and uh, they are also concerned about the health, health of the coral, but this follows up on one of the images we saw earlier. They want to know how does the temperature probe stay on the coral without killing it? Well, we have this. Uh, um, basically, the, the temperature sensors that we are using are probably no longer or larger than 12 inches. So, uh, and the diameter is probably right now, the new instruments is about half an inch, three quarters of an inch. So, tie those instruments to corals and we try to do this very careful and try to find the best way to, uh, to um, leave the, the sensor in a matter that doesn't uh, damage the coral and also it's uh, very easy to, to see. You can imagine that we are going to, um, we go normally to these remote islands, so to come back to that specific location and then dive and find that specific sensor at that depth and that specific coral, it's very um, difficult, it's complicated, so yeah, we need to, to deal with a, a few a few methodologies that, that we have to, to prevent damage in the coral. We actually have a video question that came in there, and we'll send that right now. Sure. Hi, I'm Maxi Wolf, and I'm Larson Schaub, and we're from St. Helena School in Peoria, Illinois, and we'd like to ask you, how does your job affect your everyday life as an ocean officer? How does your job affect your everyday life as an ocean officer? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, affect my life a lot, basically, because uh, I can tell you that I have only one year here working with Red and uh, working with the Coral Reef Group, so it has been uh, a very new uh, um, experience for me. So, being part of this oceanographic group, being uh, in the water, though, that means they pay you to be in the water looking at the coral and doing something. Well, it's amazing. So every day that I have the opportunity to go with my group and then go with my family, I, I really enjoy. So yeah, oceanography is a, a 
a full full time in my uh, my my role here. And, uh, I really enjoy it. That's great. That's actually a great segue into our next portion of the program. We're going to talk about uh, how you came to be in the position that you are in now. What uh, made you even think to go into oceanography as a career? Sure, sure. Let me start with that. I mentioned that I am from, from Chile and I was born there a long time ago, so you don't want to know that. But basically I was lucky to uh, that my parents have a house on the beach. Um, there every summer, every winter break, every long weekend. So I was I was in the water every single time. So as you can see here, uh, I put together this map where uh, on the left top part you have a map of South America and you can see where Chile is located. Well, on the right side you have the same uh, idea and then you have Chile there. I was born in Santiago, which is the longest arrow there, and then I moved to Iquique when I was 17. Um, I, I moved to that uh, city because uh, I, I was uh, doing my bachelor degree in my biology. Um, when I was doing that, I was very, very happy that I, that I was able to, to dive, to participate in cruises. I was able to work with different marine animals uh, from plankton to fish to dolphin. Actually, that is a picture of my first cruise. Uh, that was when I was 17. Uh, that was around 500 miles offshore of Chile, and we were doing oceanography as the, as the old time. We don't do that anymore. That was very risky, thinking back in time. But um, from there, um, once I finished my bachelor, I, I moved to the center part of Chile again, and uh, I was part of uh, a very large international um, group of uh, marine ecologists. So from there, later um, in 2000, my family and I moved to Oregon, where I started my uh, in oceanography. Um, basically, uh, I did my master in the Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, and um, I was there for 12 years. After I finished my, my master, I was able to work with one of my friends now, an advisor at that time, uh, Dr. Dennis True, and also Dr. Ricardo Letelier, uh, who were helping me to build up this career. So in 2000, uh, 12, uh, we move again, and then we are here now in, in Oahu, so enjoying the, the weather, enjoying being in the ocean every single day, and yeah, enjoying the food. We have another related question from a student in the staff's class. Uh, they want to know how many years of college did you go through uh, to get to the point in your career that you are now? Sure, that's a good question. Um, actually, I will did my master's degree in two and a half years, and uh, basically um, was a, a summary of uh, all the oceanography disciplines, and then uh, my specific thesis was related to understand oceanographic patterns in uh, Washington and Oregon coast, and um, by using most of the data from uh, Southern another question this one comes all the way from australia uh, they want to know what subjects would you recommend to high school students if they are interested in your career path that's a very good question um, you should take all the sign classes for sure and uh, that can give you a good base to go to, to school and then uh, have more um, background about what they are going to teach you because it's going to be a little more tough and a little more of uh, um, understanding of the connectivity between the different uh, science, specifically if you are going for uh, oceanography. Our next question is from Bailey. Uh, you know, if you could have any job in the world, would you choose the one you have or would you pick something different? Definitely, I will stay where I am now. Yeah. I really enjoy it and uh, I really like it where we are. My family is happy with us, so that is a compliment to And uh, yeah, I invite you to, to look at Ocean Number. It's a good place to be. That's happy with what you're doing. We've got another question here. Uh, this one's a video question from Luke. 
As a kid, who did you look up to and respect? As a kid, based on the oceanographic point of view and the marine uh, uh, area, uh, of course, Jack Cousteau was uh, the person to follow. He showed me that feeling about the ocean, the different colors. He showed me the opportunity to die. So yeah, definitely, I'm very happy that I had the opportunity to follow him. And unfortunately, I never met him, but um, just by going to the ocean, it's basically feeling what he teach me at that time. Here's a, another follow-up from Angie uh, to that last question. If you weren't an oceanographer, what would you be? Um, I would say archaeology. I really like that. And basically because uh, doing my field work, in, especially in the north part of Chile, we, we, do, uh, we did a lot of oceanography in the coastal area. And we were able to, to go to these uh, remote uh, areas where nobody, nobody was seen. And therefore, I don't know, natives, people were only there before. So we found a lot of uh, um, marine uh, fossils, and that was impressive for me. Yeah, if you have the opportunity, try to go to one of these regions where you can find fossils. That's amazing. We're going to talk about fossils just at the end of the program, too, actually. That's our event next week. Um, we want to talk a little bit more about you, just the, the personal side of your life when you're not working, and we have a question from Ethan that's going to get us kicked into that area. Uh, he wants to know, what do you do when you're not working? Well, I have a family and I have, uh, we try to go to the beach every day if we can. And uh, when I have time, I have my own kayak and uh, I enjoy my kayak. And uh, I like to go fishing. I like to be in the water uh, if I can most of the time. So, yeah, you can see in there that... I was building the uh, kayak in a fishing machine, so I will see in the next few weeks how that works. I am still in that process. Ben and Jake have a related question. They want to know, do you have any hobbies? Yeah, uh, well, fishing, I like soccer, um, and uh, I really like to go to the sea. It's probably one of my biggest hobbies, being at the sea and look at me. Around that picture is from from Saipan, one of my last trips over there, and uh, that was fantastic. Uh, the Saipan is in the Marianas Island, it's a tiny island, and that is a marine protected area. So that was fantastic. Being the water as a hobby that was really nice. We've got a question from Cameron in North Carolina. Wants to know where did you enjoy diving the most? Definitely warm water. Whatever is warm water, I will do that. I was, as I mentioned before, I was in, in Oregon, and unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of wind, which is basically the, the movement of water from the deep, which is cold, coming to the surface due to wind and effect. So, what you have in there is basically almost year round cold water. So for diving, it was not very good for me, but I have friends that they really enjoy it. So it's another view of what's in the ocean. You have different species of fish and different sizes and yeah, colors. And yeah, you should try to. We've got just a few minutes left in the program, so we are going to go rapid fire into Q&A mode here. And actually, this next question, uh, we just touched upon it. It's from Miss Borders class. They're in the Pacific Northwest. They're surrounded by water. They want to know how you compare the biodiversity of Hawaii with Puget Sound. Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I continue to dive in Puget Sound, but I saw a picture of people that were diving there. And uh, the biodiversity, I think, is um, it's you have more um, species in one place than the other, and, uh, but the number of uh, individuals per species is different. So what is common between the two areas is that you have um, a 
lot of different shapes and different colors in this biodiversity of I am talking here about fish and especially and uh, that was uh, uh, impressive to, to see to compare and uh, actually because I was working in that area with satellite data and now I am doing the same here in Hong so I can have uh, an understanding of the dynamics that are producing this biodiversity in the two places. Our next question is from David. He wants to know, what's it like living on a boat for extended periods of time? I have, um, that's a good question, and I, I like that question because I have my own theory. Um, I say that this is like a, um, a hill, imagine a, a hill, a mountain. Um, basically, when you start and the cruise, you are very happy and you enjoy every single moment, but at some point during the cruise, um, you reach this point of that you start missing the land and you start missing your family. But again, as time is moving in this direction, um, the curve goes down again and then you are happy again and you enjoy the last few minutes that you are going to be in that boat and doing what you want to do with your friends. At the same time, it's kind of a, a nice to have your own room and have your own food, somebody cook for you, you have your own bathroom. So yeah, the only part that I don't like much is when we have a rough sea and we get seasick. Yeah, it's like that is fantastic. We've got a, uh, a very current event related question here. Um, did El Nino affect the Philippines super typhoon? Oh, that's a good question. I am looking at that actually. I want to see how this uh, changing in surface temperature is affecting this pattern of, uh, uh, of these storms going, uh, sorry, going to the Philippines. Um, tell you true, I can't answer that right now to you, but uh, I hope to be able to do that very soon. As I mentioned before, we are working with um, institutions and universities in the Philippines and Indonesia right now, so we are um, kind of concerned about this situation. Our next question, uh, another student, this is Dan's class, wants to know, how are you not scared to be out of the ocean? And what does it feel like when you go and take samples? I can tell you that um, that sensation of being in the middle of the ocean and check yourself, it's amazing. So I don't think so that I have been scared except in one specific cruise in uh, um, offshore Oregon, where the vessel was forced to, instead of uh, go away from the storm, we were um, crossing the storm and going to the center, basically to to reduce the amount of uh, tilt and, uh, and sickness in people. So, um, yeah, besides that, um, for me, it's fantastic to meet new students, relaxing, and, uh, and yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Great, we've got time for one last question here. This is from Aiden. He wants to know what is your favorite type of coral? And can you tell us about it? Sure, I am not an expert in corals. I am just starting to learn about corals, but um, it is a table coral. Um, I think uh, Patrick has a short video um, that probably he can show. All right, you're going to put me on the spot. <laughs> just sorry to. Let's hope this is the one. You. But basically, yeah, that is a table coral, and it's even they look like tables and then you have a lot of uh, biodiversity, you know, fish around these areas because you have areas where they can hide, they have a lot of food, and uh, that's beautiful to be there. Very nice, They're very lovely. So unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's event. I want to thank Robert for joining us. He's, he's taking uh, a lot of this time, and just during the line of time, but leading up to it, we will. So we are going to continue with the presentation. and uh, So I am going to show you now some of the analysis and results that I have been working on um, during these uh, six years that I have been now here. So first I want to clarify 
what is the fact between what is weather and what is climate. So you can see in there that weather is what we see over a short period of time in a given location versus climate is the average of the weather pattern to see that we see over a long period of time. So you cannot relate weather to climate except when you do this long-term average. And uh, so to understand um, some of the effects of the climate change due to the warming of the ocean in this case, we study um, how the temperature uh, the change in temperature conditions in Southeast Asia will affect a specific species of fish, in this case, uh, skipjack tuna. So what we did was basically to analyze data from this region in Southeast Asia, where you can see Philippines and Indonesia here. And what we, uh, specifically what we do was to analyze climate data projections. So how uh, we understand the temperature is going to be in the next few uh, or until 2100. So what we did we, was to um, basically compare, and you can see here, I think, yeah, uh, the year 2055 to the 2015. So here in the different colors that you see in the color bar, is the change in temperature that you are going to have at one specific location. So saying that the yellow and red colors are going to be positive and the blue, light blue and dark blue are going to be um, colder. So in 2055, in comparison to 2015, all the area is going to be a little bit warmer. So when, do, when we do, sorry, the same comparison, but between 2015 and 2100, we can see that the change in temperature is going to be higher. So you can see that most of the region, if not all of it, is going to be above 2.5 to 2 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. So that change in temperature, knowing that the training temperature is going up, is going to affect the different uh, uh, species, and in this case, skipjack tuna, because they are used to be in colder water based on this trend and looking at the, at the long-term uh, temperature. So what we were looking at specifically was to identify by looking at this change in temperature, how the spawning of a skipjack tuna is going to happen. So this is probably very overwhelming for you guys and for me too, but I am going to try to explain what's happening here. So especially, I, I, I want you to look at the right side of this uh, figure. And basically what you have in here is February of 2010 temperature and June of 2010 temperature. And then we jump to the second row, which where you have March of 2040 and July of 2040. And then we go to the next row and you have March of 2070 and July of 2070. And then you have March of 2099 and July of 2099. So basically what you are seeing in these two columns, meaning this column and the next one, is the change in the season that we see in the long-term uh, climate change uh, condition of uh, in the water temperature. So the colors in here is the probability of finding um, areas where skipjack tuna is going to be able to spawn. So as you can see, the probability it's going higher in some part and in others is going completely opposite. So that change in temperature is going to allow you to understand how that population of a skipjack tuna is going to move depending on the condition of the water temperature. So if you were fishing for a small tuna in some area because they were spawning close to that area and they stay in there eating and growing, then now with the higher temperature they are probably going to move to the same temperature that they are used to. And now that temperature is going to move from the equator to the higher latitudes. 
So another study that we have been doing, and let me go to here, I want to mention this. It's, if you remember in the previous slide, I show you the areas where we have been working. So these are the different islands where the, the coral reef group is going to uh, monitoring the coral, the fish, and the oceanographic conditions. So we go to the Marianas and Guam. We go to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, all of the main uh, Hawaiian islands. And we go to the um, Equatorial Pacific Remote Islands area and the North area of the Pacific Remote Island area. We also go to American Samoa and some of the islands around that area. So for this is a specific study, what we are looking at is that um, we get the information from those loggers that you saw that we install in the corals. So those loggers, those recorders are basically taking uh, temperature data every few minutes. And we have a long time series. Once we recover the, the loggers, we can download the, late, the data and we can uh, create this time series. So we can see how the temperature is changing in that condition. When we analyze all the data, <coughs> excuse me, for all of the islands, we can have a better understanding of how the temperature change between islands, between regions, and at different depths. So we have loggers from one meter all the way to about 38 meters. So you have in some areas a very well um, data set uh, that can, you can observe the, the very clear pattern of the condition of the temperature and the seasonality and the long-term change in temperature being warmer or going colder in some areas. So when we have that, we do, sorry, um, do you collect this satellite data? We also collect the satellite data, and that is the next comment that I have for this analysis. How much does it cost to use the satellite data? Is it free access, or is it...? So you have two kinds of satellite data. You have private, private data, and you have uh, public data. So basically, uh, we, everybody, can access uh, free data from satellite, saying, for example, temperature or wind conditions, or the salinity in the ocean, and so on and so on. If you want to know more specific about that, I can give you some specific information about where to go, the links, and how to download the data. And, and, uh, so, well, as I mentioned here, we have all the data from the in situ, from the, uh, the first 38 meters in the water column, and we compare with, sorry, with the satellite data at the same location. So we go and extract from satellite data, one is processed, we go to that area and we extract time series of data that is coming from satellite. Well, you need to do some analysis, it's not as simple as that. And when we do that analysis, you can see here that this data is showing the summer thermal bias, which is the difference between the satellite, uh, the in situ data in this case, sorry, minus the satellite data. So when you have that, you can uh, basically plot and do some statistics and understand how that chain is. So to better understand how this works is you have the satellite and the satellite is trying to understand what is the condition of, uh, well, with the sensor you get some information about the condition of the temperature in the surface of the ocean. But what we are doing is having all this instrumentation so we can understand how different is that temperature to the temperature that we have in the depth, but at the same time, at the same place. So when we do the difference, we see that as you move in the depth in this uh, column here and the, in the left side, you can see that up to 40 meters, the difference is pretty big. So we are talking about between one and two degrees Celsius different that you cannot see from the satellite because that is the condition that is happening in the bottom of the of this water column where we go around the islands where the coral reefs are located. So what we are trying to understand now is basically a theory that says that the deeper that you go in the coral reef, um, the more refuge that you are going to have. So the water temperature is not going to affect you and the coral is going to survive. 
Well, what happened is with the analysis that we are working right now, we, un we identify that this is not happening as uh, some people were predicting before. So we see that at depth, we have some um, thermal effect in there, different uh, events of warmer temperature. And we see that now in the first 38 meters of the water column in most of the islands that we are working on, uh, this refuge is not there anymore, probably. So we are doing right now this analysis with the temperature data. And the next step is to apply this uh, analysis to the data that we have from coral. So we are better going to understand if that is real or not, and what species are being affected or not, and if it's bleaching everywhere or not, and how that is related in time in all of this region. So that is the the other analysis that we are um, that we are working on. So saying that, I want to thank everybody for coming today, and uh, these are some picture of my family, and actually my two kids are over there. My wife is over here. And uh, our dog is not here. But. <laughs> so again, thank you very much for. Uh, we have time for two questions. Just two. Oh, I didn't show two. that one. Two. So we'll go with your question and your question. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, I have a misconception, but I think I learned something from your chart. Okay. I always That's good. thought El Nino, the phenomenon of El Nino, yeah. was a movement of water by the equatorial region yeah. from west to east, but I'm wrong. I, I'm going to show that thing is now. Well, up. the propagation is in both ways. The waves are coming yeah, down with it. But you, season, but yeah. El Nino, yeah. from what I saw, was from east to west, right? El Nino. Mm -hmm. And La Nina is the reverse. Well, you pile water on the west side of the Pacific, and then the water come back. So you have El Nino effect, yeah, in there. And La Nina is the opposite. When you don't have warm water in there, you have the opposite, which is cold water in there. So that is the, the modes of this water movement in the Pacific between cold and warm. Thank you. Yeah. With your interest in archaeology, yeah. is there any evidence of the remote peoples of Chile with contact with either Polynesians or Asians? Uh, Archaeological evidence or cultural or anthropological? You know, it's very interesting because we see, we see uh, how they arrived in the continent a long time ago. And actually, it's interesting because in the south part of Chile, the natives cook on the ground with rocks and leaves and it's the same thing that is happening in all of the polynesian cultures basically so they were moving all over so we have some uh archaeologic um information especially in the north part i think they were following some specific currents that they were getting in the north part of chile and then you have i think the the peruvians were doing some kind of a test of uh, doing uh, just following the currents going all the way to the Polynesian. So you have some kind of a circulation pattern there that allows that that um, movement of of people actually, if just just by following the currents. So I don't know if that answered your question. But. Oh, is, there any, is there any evidence in Chile of Polynesian contact? Yeah. Or is there any evidence in Chile of like Asia contact? You know, ancient mariners making it, making contact with the indigenous tribes. Oh, at that level, no. We have found uh, instrumentation or pieces of um, um, uh, material that they were using for cooking or in some of the beaches in the central part of Chile. But I don't know if they related to the other cultures. Okay. Yeah. But we have, again, we have 15 different. Um, native groups in, in the Chilean coast who will not surprise me if they, they were going, coming and going at some point. Yeah. They were, they, they are an expert in navigation, so. Yeah.